In 1986, Santa Cruz, California turned into the vampire-infested town of Santa Carla for the film The Lost Boys, directed by Joel Schumacher. Judith Belay, who was the second assistant director, was responsible for location scouting and casting extras. After announcing a casting call in the Santa Cruz Sentinel, the production would take over the Holiday Inn and see over 2,400 extras, a majority of which were Santa Cruz locals. In the end, they would go on to cast 800 extras to fill out the boardwalk scenes. The Lost Boys will always have a special place in Santa Cruz history, so let's go take a look at some of the places where our fanged friends would have hung out. In the opening sequences, we are shown multiple shots in and around the boardwalk to get a glimpse of what kind of town our protagonists, Michael and Sam Emerson, are about to move into. We see their mother, Lucy, driving her 1968 Toyota FJ55 through Westcliff Drive when they all see the sign that they are now entering Santa Carla or more infamously known as the murder capital of the world. There's one thing in Santa Carla you'll have to learn to stomach. What's that? All the damn vampires. Our first stop is Grandpa's house located on 333 Golf Club Drive. Built in 1911 by Santa Cruz promoter, later Mayor Fred Swanton, it opened in 1912 as the Casa del Rey Golf and Country Clubhouse. Unfortunately, Swanton declared bankruptcy shortly after the clubhouse opened. In 1935, it was reopened as the Pogo Nip Polo Club by Dorothy Deming Wheeler. Efforts have been made to restore the building to its former glory, but it looks like after Grandpa drove his International M24 into the building, it's been gated up for preservation. Next stop is the Santa Cruz Wharf where Lucy meets Max, the owner of the video store. The location is currently home to the Santa Cruz Bay Company. After charming Lucy, Max invites her to a dinner at a fancy restaurant. Since 2003 it has been Olida's Cantina and Grill. I tried to find out what it was prior but Google didn't want to Google. I was able to find a promotional map of Santa Cruz from 1985 and if you look very closely at it, in the location where Olita's would be, it says the Hungry Pelican Restaurant. Unfortunately, a running theme throughout this video is going to be that the Loma Prieta earthquake of 1989 destroyed half of these locations, which could explain the lack of information on them. And because Lucy can't catch a break with her boys ruining her dates with Max, he finally invites her to his home which would have been located on Seaview Drive in Aptos, California. Where are you going, Star? For a ride. Of course we have to talk about the multiple shots taken throughout the boardwalk itself. A lot has changed since then, especially because the boardwalk went through a huge 10-month renovation in 2016. The 
first time we see Star is during Tim Capello's musical performance on the beach. He was performing on the boardwalk's old bandstand, which unfortunately fell victim to Loma Prieta. The renovated bandstand would be seasonal and only put out during the summer months when the boardwalk would host its free concerts on the beach. With today's climate, the boardwalk has scaled down the concerts on the beach, but still hosts live music on their colonnade stage. What's your name? Star. Oh, your folks too, huh? What do you mean? x -50s. I came this close to being called Moonbeam or Moonshine. Something like that. The star is great, I like the star. Me too. I'm Michael. Michael's great, I like Michael. Wanna get something to eat? Michael and Star have their first conversation in front of the Beach Shack gift shop where Michael debates on getting his ear pierced, most likely to impress Star. They walk in front of the hot dog on a stick stand which still exists today and somehow spawn directly in front of the sun shops which is a lot further down the boardwalk. So where we are now, this is Day's Market. This is where in the opening sequence you saw that whale that was protruding out of, I, I can't remember where exactly, but it was coming out of this wall over here. It's not there anymore, unfortunately. I wonder what happened to it. I don't know. Well, this time I do know. Unfortunately, Loma Prieta got to it. Day's Market isn't directly located on the boardwalk, it's actually about a six minute drive away towards Seabright Beach. Even with the snout gone, we did get this awesome mural painted as tribute to it. Notice anything unusual about Santa Carla yet? Atlanta's Fantasy World is the comic book shop that the Frog Brothers Edgar and Alan work at. It's where Sam Emerson first meets them. While being portrayed as part of the boardwalk, the location was actually closer to downtown Santa Cruz. Originally, the comic book store took over the building of a former family grocery store that was built in the 1930s. It was located at 707 Pacific Avenue. Unfortunately, Loma Prieta took that shop down, and now that location is just an empty plot of land in between a former art exhibition and the Ocean View Casino. After the 89 quake, Atlantis Fantasy World relocated into an 800 square foot section of a 6,000 square foot tent before permanently moving into its current location in 1992. Joe Ferrara, the owner of the store, actually makes a small cameo in the film if you look very closely. He's playing on the little pinball machine in the back. What you're looking at is a movie prop. It's not a real comic book. It was created just to fool the camera. They did this cover because what this really is on the inside is this, this vanity comic. <clears throat> She's a female detective. So they grabbed this comic and they put this cover on it. And they shoved two pages of vampire art in the middle. If you open this book, see that? Okay, there she is. If you open this book, there she is, and I've not done that for anybody else but you guys. So here you have the reality of the myth, the man behind the mask. Here we go. It's the same book <laughs> with a fake cover and two center pages oh to pull the camera. 
That's all they do in Hollywood is to fool the camera. So, this is only a prop. When they left, they left it with us. Oh. And people come from all over the world to get their picture taken with this movie prop. And somebody offered me a lot of money, and I said, no way. You get to keep this. <laughs> and here we are, 30 years later, people still come in every day and talk about Lost Boys. And we have the Visitors Council has put out a map about all the locations that you can visit that we're using the filming of the movie. And I auditioned for the part of the comic store owner and did not get it because I did not look burned out enough. So I had to be satisfied playing an extra in the background playing the pinball machine in the movie. And then 20 years later when they put the DVD out, they had a big panel in San Diego and the two cores were on the panel. And they had extra, uh, extras in the DVD and the actors would talk about different scenes and their little commentaries. And the first scene that Sam walks into the store, he's impressing them with his comic knowledge. And when they finished shooting the scene, that he had said, well, I'm always looking for Batman Volume 2, Number 7. And I just kind of chuckled, because at the time there was no such thing. There was no Batman Volume 2. So I walked over to the director and I said, Joel, if you're going for a laugh, you're going to get it. But if you're trying to establish that he knows what he's talking about, he just blew the whole scene. And they had to stop everything. And they had, took him an hour to get on the phone, find the writer in Los Angeles, because there were no cell phones in those days. And OK, a line change. And I can still see Schumacher standing there with the phone going, Joe, how about Batman 14? And I go, fine. Did I get a credit? Uh, no, I didn't get no credit. But that was fine. And uh, at the con, the uh, court, uh, Corey Feldman in the inset was talking about that scene and he said, all I remember is we had to stop because somebody said you can't say that. And when I, they took question and answers when I got to the mic, I said, well, you don't recognize me because that was my store 20 years ago you guys were in. And Feldman grabbed the mic and said, so you know what I was talking about? And I said, dude, I was a guy. And I explained the story. And then I had a question for, uh, I said, I have a question for Corey Haim. I said, you read every Archie comic in my store during the breaks. I said, do you still read Archie comics? And of course, he was in his 30s at the time, and his head went like that, and he looks up and goes, no. <laughs> and everybody howled, and it was really fun. Aww. So just a little behind-the-scenes stuff about the Lost Boys movie. Wow, thank you so much. You're welcome. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Now we're going to put it back on the wall. What's happening, Star? I don't know. I don't know how to help you. Whoa. You okay? Look like you had a nightmare. I guess so. Say, you know where Hudson's bluff is overlooking the play? One of the most memorable scenes in the film is the motorcycle race scene. After David challenges Michael near the sun shops, they ride down the steps of the colonnade through the beach where they end up on the edge of the cliff right above their giant coffin. Hudson's bluff is actually one of the locations that wasn't in Santa Cruz. The exterior of the cave was shot at Terrania Cove Beach in Rancho Palos Verdes, California. It's about a six hour drive south from Santa Cruz. The interior shots of the cave were done at Stage 12 located inside of the Warner Brothers Studios in Burbank, California. Speaking of Warner Brothers, the church where the Frog Brothers run to collect holy water was also filmed on the back lot on the Midwest Street. You're able to visit this location at the Warner Brothers Studio Tour, but just be mindful they do not allow video recordings. Back at the boardwalk, we can't forget the famous carousel scene at the beginning of the film. David and his gang cause a commotion at the Louvre carousel before being kicked off of the boardwalk. 
The carousel was delivered to the boardwalk in 1911 by Danish woodcarver Charles I.D. Loof. His son Arthur Loof would go on to build the boardwalk's giant dipper in 1924. What's going on? Who wants to know? Located next to the boardwalk is a train trestle that is similar to the one used in the film. Locals have lovingly given it the nickname Lost Boys Bridge, but the one that is actually used in the film is located in Santa Clarita, California. Just off of Magic Mountain Parkway is the Iron Horse Trailhead Trestle where the boys would have dangled off of as the train zoomed on by. It strikes a lot of similarities to the train trestle at the boardwalk, which is why they could have been using this location. Yeah, because if Marco had to walk across this, he would have slipped through the cracks. I think I offended him. The Lost Boys would go on to release in theaters on July 31st, 1987. Though it wasn't an instant hit at the box office, video rental sales would help the film gain its spot in pop culture, inspiring many of the vampire media we see today. Throughout the years, I've had the pleasure of meeting many of the people that have worked on the film. I especially enjoy hearing stories from Santa Cruz locals that were part of the film. There's something so wonderful about seeing the way they light up when they talk about it. <laughs> 